Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we find ourselves back in the 1940s Los Angeles. Most players will step into the shoes of LAPD homicide detectives hungry for glory and willing to do whatever it takes to successfully close a case, even if that means intimidating suspects, concealing evidence, and hiring snitches to rat on their fellow detectives. However, one player will take on the role of the chisel, whose only goal is to stall and misdirect the detectives at every turn using bluffing, manipulation, and often outright lies. Detective City of Angels is a game of mystery, deception, and investigation for one to five players. It's for ages 14 and up, takes 30 to 150 minutes to play, and is published by Van Ryder Games. Today we'll be doing a rule school where I'll teach you how to set up and play the game so that you don't have to read the rule book yourself. Now I've placed timestamps below me in the description of this video just in case you want to jump to a specific section of the rules. Without further ado, let's get started. Detective City of Angels is a game of mystery, deception, and investigation for one to five players, where most of you will be detectives trying to be the first one to solve one of many different cases. You'll be moving around Los Angeles in the 1940s, and you'll be searching different locations, or suspects, or even questioning them. But one player plays as the chisel, and they only win if none of the detectives solve the case. And that chisel will be looking at a grid of different possible responses and placing one secretly so the detective can read it. And if it's a lie or misdirection, the detective can challenge and if they're correct, they'll gain leverage over a suspect, making them be able to tell the truth in a future questioning. But if the chisel was wrongly challenged by the detective, the chisel gains leverage over that detective, giving the chisel the upper hand on future questioning from that detective. Players will be spending actions off their turn and possibly even bribing snitches to listen in to other players' responses. You can also play a one to five player version with a sleuth casebook, or a head to head version where all the detectives work cooperatively together against the chisel. I'm gonna teach you how to set up and play the classic mode, which is for three to five players. At the end of this video, I'll briefly discuss the other two ways to play, sleuth mode, which is one to five players, and head to head, which is two to five players with the detectives playing cooperatively. Even if you're planning on playing one of those other two alternate methods, still watch this entire video because many of the rules you'll learn in this classic mode will carry over to those other modes. I'm gonna teach you how to set up and play the introductory case, Blood on the Pier. First, put the board in the middle of the table where everyone can reach it. And on the bottom left hand side of the board, you're going to put the scratch, which is money, and denominations of ones and fives. Next, you're going to select which player is going to play as the chisel. They're going to be playing against all the other detectives. Now, the other detectives are also playing against each other, but the chisel plays against everybody. They have their own book, which clearly says do not read this unless you are the rule of the chisel, because it has all the solutions and things in it. Now in the introduction page, the chisel should read this. It basically talks about the different ways you can play the chisel. The recommended way is to sort of act like a game master, making sure everybody has the best experience. And that may mean that you're not trying to explicitly win the game because the chisel will win if none of the detectives actually solve the crime. The chisel should become very familiar with the case, reading the briefing, and I'm not gonna show you any more, but they should also read the epilogue and the solution so they know everything about the case. This is gonna help them play the game well and make sure that everybody has a good time. The chisel is then gonna find the tuck box for the case we're playing. In this case, it's Blood on the Pier, and there are gonna be different types of cards. There's gonna be case cards, some search cards, and there's gonna be some response cards, which are square ones. I'm not gonna show you what these look like. They also go under the sleeve that the chisel will find as well to make sure that other players cannot read what these cards say. Now, these response cards and the search cards will stay in front of the chisel. Now, these case cards will all get placed face down on the corresponding letter on the board. Just like that. You'll find a pack of cards, and once you unwrap them, you'll see grift cards, favor cards, and evidence removed by. You can remove the grift and favor cards as those are advanced variants. You'll keep these in front of you as the chisel. You'll also put the evidence removed markers for the letters that have to do with this case. In this case, it's A through G. You can put those right next to the chisel as well. Now that you have all the cards ready for the chisel, you can place the board there and place the cards in the certain spots, like the search cards, the response cards, and you can just leave the evidence removed and the markers here just above it. 
The chisel is then going to find the suspect punch board and they're gonna punch out only the suspects that are in this specific case. In this case, it's the first three ones. They're gonna punch these out and put them on standees and keep it next to them. Each detective is gonna select a color and they're gonna take the board that has that color. You wanna make sure you use this side, the one that has actions in the upper right, not this side that says sleuth or head to head only because this side is only used in those different alternative ways to play the game. And so each player is going to place their colored cubes on the boxes as shown here. They're going to have their eight hats, which are their leverage markers. They're going to have eight of their knowledge markers, the two bribe a snitch tokens, a solve, and a little base that they'll place a miniature on. So each player is going to select one of these miniatures to put that colored base of their own type on. And it'll look something like this. Each detective will give one of their leverage markers to the chisel, which they'll place on their board. Then the detective sitting just to the left of the chisel will take four scratch and place it on their board. The next detective to the left will take one more, so five scratch. The next detective to their left will take one more, six scratch. And if there's a fourth detective, they take nine scratch. They'll then take their bribe a snitch token and place them here and their solve token here. Next, give each detective their very own detective case book. Then all the detectives and the chisel open up their case books to the blood on the pier case. Then the player sitting to the right of the chisel will read the case briefing out loud for everybody. But if you want to hear a professionally voiced narration of the case briefing, go to VanRiderGames.com and then click on Games, then Detective City of Angels to hear them there. And as you read through the briefing, it's going to have you place certain suspects onto certain spots of the board. There's also a summary of all those in the bottom left there. So after reading the briefing, cards A through D should be face up, and the D standee should be on card D. The dumb standee should be on 43, the Charlie mugs should be on 96, and the crime scene marker should be placed right on 99, the horseshoe pier. Next, you're going to place this black day marker. Now, normally in scenarios, you'll be placing it here, here, or here, depending on whether you have two, three, or four players as shown on the board. But this scenario has some special rules, so you'll place it depending on here. For example, with four detectives, you'd use it on, you know, number four. With three detectives, day five. And with two detectives, day six. We have three detectives, so we're going to start it on day five. Each detective will get an investigation sheet, and you'll be filling it out with a pen or pencil that is not included in the game. And you'll place the three suspect names here. And you'll also place the names of the cards, A, B, C, and D, up here like this as well, making a grid. This is going to be a way that you'll be taking notes as you begin to question and find out different aspects of the crime. The object of the game depends on the scenario. Like in this case, you must identify the guilty suspect, the weapon, and the suspect's motive. If you're a detective, you're trying to be the one to do that. Now, if you're the chisel, you're trying to make it so that the other players do not get here, because if nobody solves the crime, you win. The game is played over multiple days, again, depending on the scenario and the number of players. And each day, each detective is going to take some actions, starting with the player to the left of the chisel and going in clockwise order. Now, the chisel will make decisions at key moments during the detective's turns, but will not take a turn of their own. On a detective's turn, they're going to take four actions represented by these four cubes. They'll take all four actions before it goes to the next player clockwise. They can take different actions or the same action multiple times. So let's go over all these different actions. One of the things you can do is move, and when you take an action, you place the cube from up top into that action spot. On the board, there's three different types of locations. The white ones are standard locations, the blue ones are police stations, and the orange ones are mob joints. On your first turn of the game only, you'll take your miniature and place it on any one of the blue police stations. You only do this on your first turn of the game, not your first turn each day. One single move action will allow you to move from any space in a specific district to any other space in that district. Now you'll see that there's lines. There's sort of a blue line here, another different blue line here, purple line, orange line. These are different districts and you'll see them named on the board. For one movement, you can move from one spot in any district to any other spot in that district, including ones that sort of hover over two different districts. So if I wanted to move all the way to 44, it would take me one movement to move to the end of the district I'm in, and then another movement to move to anywhere else in that district. Which means you're never th more than three moves away from anywhere on the board. So let's say I decide to move from the police station to the crime scene number 99. So we're gonna go ahead and search a location. Now, when you do this, you're investigating that location for either evidence or possibly a hidden suspect. 
The Chisel will then look through their search card deck and look for that number 99, and when they find it, they will give it to the detective that was searching there. Now, only the detective that was searching there gets to see it. Now, this does not say 99. I didn't want to spoil anything for you, so I took a random card out of one of the other random cases just to show you this would have said 99. It'll tell you some stuff. Sometimes it will have you take different cards or reveal different cards that are up on the board. Uh, sometimes it will say archive. Now, if it said archive on it, once the detective has done everything on that card and read everything, they'll place it face down on the archive section of the board. This actually has that location we were searching, 99. And this just means that no other detectives can search that location. Now, we showed you earlier, some cards say take, and it tells you the card letter on the board. You take that card, only that detective. It will also have this hand on the bottom right to also tell that detective that once you get this, you take it, nobody else can have this. Now, when evidence is taken, the chisel will place one of the evidence removed cards where it came from, and they'll place the knowledge marker of the player that took it there, showing that that's the player that took that. Now, since the blue detective was the one to take that evidence, they'd place it on their board where it says confiscated evidence. They'll put it face down. So let's say hypothetically they got that E card. The chisel will then take the evidence removed marker with that corresponding letter and place it three days down from where the current day is. One, two, three, it will go here. This means that once this day comes down to here, it will get revealed for the rest of the players. Now, there are ways to get it early, but we'll show you how that works later. And if you find a piece of evidence and there are not three days left, you won't place an evidence removed marker at all. I'll also explain later how detectives can learn about cards if there's no marker on the board. So let's assume we fast forward a few days and other players were able to gain knowledge of that card. Anytime you gain knowledge of a card that's been removed, you'll place your knowledge marker there, letting you know that you can look at that card at any time. If someone tries to search a location that does not have a search card, the chisel will have a card that says all other locations that they'll give only to that detective. And if you're searching for a suspect, similarly, the chisel will look for the actual suspect's name as opposed to a location number when someone's searching a location. And as you can see, search suspect is one of the different actions you can take. Of course, you need to be in the same location of that suspect. You can also question. If you're in the location of a suspect, you can question them for a specific action. So let's say we were in the location here with Charlie Muggs. We could question Charlie. So let's talk about the very basics of questioning. If you remember in your investigation sheet, you have the different suspects and you have the different cards. Now, as you gain knowledge of cards, like if we had gained that knowledge of E, we would you know, write what that is there. Of course, you don't want other people to see what that is. But you can ask Charlie about any of the things that you have knowledge of. So you could ask Charlie about Sally or Dumb or D or other sus possible suspects or items and things like that. And that in that grid is what you're going to write the answer to that you get. So if we asked Charlie about D, you'd write in here and you'd have that information. Now, if you had knowledge of some of these cards, you wouldn't actually say what they are because they've maybe only been revealed to you. If you had want to ask about E, you wouldn't actually say what it is. You'd say, hey, I'm going to question Charlie about E. That way no one else knows what you're asking about. But in this case, let's say Charlie is going to ask about Sally. Now, after the type of question is mentioned, before the response is given, each player is going to decide if they want to try to possibly bribe a snitch to listen in on the answer. Now, there's two snitch tokens. One of them says bribe, one of them says pass. Each player is going to decide whether they want to bribe or pass, and they're going to place their chosen face down on the top left of their board like that. Once all players have decided with their snitch tokens, then the uh, chisel is going to give their answer. Keep in mind, you'll need to have at least three scratch in order to snitch, meaning placing the bribe face down. Otherwise, you'd have to place the pass face down. Now, if you remember, the chisel started with one leverage marker for each detective. Now, after each detective has placed their snitch token down, now remember, the chisel won't know what's on the back side of this. They can decide to spend one leverage marker for a detective to block a snitch. And they can do this for any or all detectives that they have a leverage marker for. To do this, they take one of these and they would give it to that detective back to them. And essentially, it would block the snitch, meaning they won't get to possibly block them, meaning they won't get to see the response that's given to that other detective. The chisel in their book has a grid, the same grid that looks similar to this. And in that grid, whoever's questioning uh, who about what, there'll be possibly multiple responses there, depending on different things. Yeah. For every question, there is always a single black response, which is called the most useful response. This is the best response and it is always true. 
although it may not be as useful as the detectives would wish. When asking questions, this is always the response that the detectives want to receive. And then there's possibly, maybe, one or more than one red responses, which are essentially mistruths or misdirections or outright, outright lies. So the chisel will take one of these responses and they'll get ready to give it to that detective. Now the chisel has a bunch of these square response cards. They would look for the number and the letter corresponding to the response in that book that they'd want to give the detective. Now, of course, this is a random card from a different scenario just to show how it works, but let's say they wanted to give response 9A. They would place this in this sleeve just like this, and then they would give it to the detective, only the one that asked for it. They would pass it to them face down. Now, after the detective that asked the question originally looked at the response, they can decide to challenge or not. And you do this if you think that the chisel has given you a lie or a misdirection. Now, if the detective does want a challenge, they'll take one of their leverage markers and they'll give it directly to the chisel who will hold on to it just for now. Now, if the response that the chisel gave the detective actually was the most useful response, then the marker that was given to the chisel gets placed on the chisel's board and now they have leverage over that detective. However, if the chisel placed anything other than the best response, meaning a lie or misdirection, then the chisel will place that leverage marker underneath the suspect that was being questioned, Charlie Muggs in this case. Now, the detectives gain leverage over suspects and we'll show you, you know, how these are used in just a moment where the chisel gains leverage over the detectives. One of the things he can do, as we talked about, was to block a snitch. We'll talk about something else he can do with this leverage later. And if that chisel was correctly challenged, they would take this card out and they would put in the most useful response and then give it to that questioning detective. Then each player will flip over their bribe a snitch token. And if it said bribe, they must pay three of their scratch to do the snitch and they would get the final card that was in that sleeve that was given to the detective that asked the original question. So they're gonna get the same information. Now let's talk about a few other ways that leverage can be used. When a detective has leverage over a suspect, they can use this. Now when they question this suspect before they say the question, they can say they're using leverage over this suspect, they would take this leverage marker back into their own supply, and now they've used this leverage on this suspect. Now this means two things. All other detectives are locked out and they cannot use their bribe as snitch tokens when someone uses that leverage over a suspect. So it keeps everyone else away from seeing the information that you're about to get. It also means that the response that's given to you has to be the most useful response no matter what when you use that leverage. And keep in mind, when you do use that leverage on the suspect, you must do so before you get the first response. You gotta do it right up front. Now the chisel can use the leverage in one other way. When a detective asks a question, they can spend this leverage by giving it back to that detective, blocking that question, meaning that they can't get any answer to it. Now there is an exception to this, but before we get to that exception, if both the chisel has leverage and the detective has leverage over the suspect being questioned, the detective's leverage has priority, meaning they can spend their leverage first, and that would mean that the chisel would not be able to block the question in that case. Now back to that exception, if the chisel blocks your question by spending leverage over you, you can spend two scratch to hire a goon, and now you can actually get the response after all to that question. If players need a reminder, there is a summary of the questioning process on the back of the chisel casebook. Now, there's two other actions that we haven't talked about yet. Analyze is you just simply receive one scratch for each action cube you place there. And kickback, now you must be in a mob joint, one of the orange spots, and you can only do it once per turn, but you'll get the amount of scratch equal to the number of players, meaning the chisel and detective. So in this case, we have three detectives. You'd get four scratch, three for the three detectives and one for the chisel. Now let's show you some of these other actions you can take by spending scratch. They never cost you any of these cubes. For example, bribing a detective costs two scratch. Now you must be at the same location of a detective that has knowledge of one of the cards, and then you give them the two scratch. So you give them the two scratch and you get to see whatever card this is, in this case F, this detective would have to show it to you. And when bribing another detective, they cannot refuse bribes because they just love money so much and if they're bribed, they will absolutely take the money and show the detective the card they have. You can also bribe an officer, now it costs three scratch, and you can do it at any police station. 
So let's say this detective was at this police station, number 95, and they wanted to gain knowledge of a card that this detective had, even way off on a different side of the board. Since they're at a police station, they simply pay that three scratch. Now they pay it to the supply. They do not pay it to the detective that they're getting the information from, because they're essentially bribing an officer at the police station. So they'll spend that three scratch to the supply and gain knowledge of a card of another detective. Now once per game, at the beginning of your turn before you take any actions, you can spend your solve token to try to solve the crime. Now how you do this is on your investigation sheet. You'll try to solve this by placing the suspect card and name. You'll put the card letter and the suspect name, the weapon letter and the weapon name, and the motive. Now detectives cannot include suspects or weapons in their guess that they don't have knowledge of. For example here, if you think the murder was committed by the lead pipe, and you think it might be case card G, but you haven't seen the lead pipe yet, you can't just write lead pipe. And you always have to write the card letter, and you have to have knowledge of that card. On the back of your detective's casebook, there'll be different motives. Now multiples of these can be correct, as long as you get one of them that's correct, it will be correct. You then hand this over to the chisel. Now if you had gotten all three, the game would end and the chisel would read the epilogue out loud to everyone. If you got less than three, he'll write down how many you got right, and you'll know how many, but you won't know which ones are correct. And if no one's guessed the solution right, at the end of the last day, meaning the last detective has taken their four actions, it goes to the final guess. And then each player will write in their final guesses just like they did when they tried to possibly solve earlier. Now they'll give this to the chisel, the chisel will look at these, but they will not tell you how many you've gotten right. Instead, the chisel will just read through the epilogue out loud to build the drama and suspense to figure out if anybody got it correct. Now if nobody got it right, the chisel wins the game. If multiple detectives got it right, the one later in turn order wins the game. Once you're familiar with the game, you can add the Grift and Favor cards. At setup, each detective will randomly get a Favor card. We'll give them a one-time special ability, like you call on a Favor to force the Chisel to use leverage against another detective. You shuffle the Grift cards and give one to the Chisel. They will use this card as the card says during the game. There are two alternate methods of playing the game. One is sleuth mode, which is for one to five players. It does not use a chisel. It uses the sleuth case book, and you'll go through different paragraphs to read through certain responses. Uh, basically, it's a chisel in the case book. And you can find out how to play this mode on page 15 of the rulebook. There's also a head-to-head -head mode, which is two to five players, and the detectives play cooperatively with each other. And you can learn about this on page 18 of the rulebook. Well, I hope this helped you dive right into Detective City of Angels and get to the fun quicker than you normally would if you had to read the rulebook yourself. Now, if you have further questions about the rules, I've placed the link below me in the description of this video, and that's the best place to ask them, because not only will I be notified, but so will Van Ryder Games.